My name is Nathan Kemmler. I'm the director of galleries and collections here. My co-host tonight is the wonderful Barbara Gordon in the back row. Thank you, Barbara, for your continued support. We have an exciting evening planned. We have a preview of our new exhibits downstairs and upstairs that you hear about in a minute. And of course, our unveiling of a newest addition to the Alton Collection. You'll be hearing directly from those involved in the project, including the artist himself here tonight. Before we get started, though, uh, I do want to uh, welcome our president, who will be giving us a special kickoff announcement welcoming to us tonight. And I just want to say that, uh, as with all the past presidents at Grand Valley, President Mantella has continued to emphasize the arts here at Grand Valley putting it in the center of campus, making sure that our students can engage with it in their every day, making that work, uh, not only having it continued, but to emphasize it and find ways to align it with our values directly. She uh, has a wonderful new strategic plan called Reach Higher, and in that plan calls for these values to be called out in very practical ways. And to show this new innovative approach, this careful planning, we have seen results already with the largest ever freshman class coming to Grand Valley right now with nearly 6,000, or almost 7,000. So thank you, President Mantello, for your, the work that you do here every day. Thank you for continuing to focus on the arts and understand its place here at the university. And please join me in welcoming her to the stage tonight. So it's, it's just a pleasure to be with you and to see so many of my friends that I've come to know. It's, it's, I'm going on my fifth year. Isn't that amazing? It feels like yesterday. I feel, still feel like I should be given the grace of a newbie given the pandemic interrupted almost three years. So, um, but, but what a joy. And I want to first acknowledge Nathan and the work he does, uh, an amazing leader who continues to inspire us around the, the question of how art can, can enliven our values, enrich our learning process, and help lift this institution as a place that is differentiated by how we appreciate liberal education in action. So would you join me in thanking Nathan for his <laughs> incredible leadership? And he, you know, whether you are a Grand Valley alum, a, a person who's been in this room for this event every single time it is offered, or you're new to us, I consider this your university. And I want to just underscore what Nathan said, your university is doing extraordinarily well attracting young people at a time where the demographics are suggesting otherwise, and the institutions around us having very different experiences. We did welcome, uh, got the final numbers today, uh, the largest and the most diverse class in the university's history. Uh, those results uh, are the first, the largest in many, many different ways in terms of the number of adult learners, in terms of the number of new graduate students, 22% increase in first-time, full-time freshmen, so lots and lots of um, signals that the university as a whole uh, is resonating with our community and that our community is understanding it as an enabler to all we want to achieve in the state of Michigan. I will say that last year I sat in this room and I see some of my newest colleagues that we've worked very closely, very deeply um, by walking through the Alton Collection through the Gordon Gallery and watching those come to life in uh, new kinds of media. And that really inspired me. And I wanna just tell you, you know, a 60 second story because sometimes we think that the art is part of the university and our ethos, but many times it is the lead. And in this case, it very much was. It was a place where I looked at what was being achieved, the art coming to life in new and different ways, and I brought these wonderful faculty members, Jonathan Engelsma, Julie Goldstein, who I see in the back, many of their colleagues, led by Nathan, and said, how did you do this, and why can't we do it in learning? This technology is going to animate, allow us to simulate things we teach out of the books, 
We teach out of um, the written word, but we can do that and allow it to come to life the way that art does. And that project has been named Project Grand Path. It now is alive and well, and they are prototyping many, many new approaches to education in XR format. And it started here in this room at this event. So I just want to say that it is, it is fabulous to have the art enrich our university, to have it enliven our values, to have it deeply embedded in liberal education, but it's also leading the way in the future of learning. And so thank you to all of my colleagues who are making that happen. Thank you to all the benefactors who have kept this front and center. I can't not thank Don and Nancy Lubbers. They led this over a number of years. And I will tell you, when we meet, and we do every semester, and he always has a little list he pulls out of his pocket, right, Nam? Sometimes it's not so little, sometimes it's big, but art, the art collection, the galleries are always among those top five things that we talk about each and every time. So know that it's top of mind for all, uh, for myself and for my predecessors, and I'm sure into the future. So thank you very much, thank you for being here, and enjoy the program. Good evening, I'm Joel Zwart. I'm the Curator of Exhibitions and Collections at Grand Valley State University. And uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about the galleries uh, here at Grand Valley State University, especially particularly the Gordon Gallery. First, I wanted to uh, thank all of you, first for your financial gifts as well as your physical gifts, and I want to highlight a few of those uh, that are here uh, in the galleries. Um, in the first floor, well, we have some, uh, some recent acquisitions that are on display, as well as some returning works. Um, there are a few new portraits in the gallery on the first floor. So if you haven't taken the time before the program, I'd encourage you to afterwards to go into the gallery. Um, on the left there is a portrait of Camilla Alton Ademan. Uh, that was actually, she took a little trip around the state of Michigan along with a number of other works. So we're integrating a few of the works from that traveling show back into the main gallery. Uh, and then on the right, uh, a new acquisition. We actually, we have two works uh, from Pat and Chuck Bloom. Thank you, Pat and Chuck. Uh, this is a portrait of William G. Herpelsheimer. Uh, I think many of you longtime Grand Rapidians know of Herpelsheimer's, the, department, the famous department store here in Grand, Grand Rapids. Uh, was started in 1870 uh, by William G. Herpelsheimer. Uh, and Pat's family uh, is descendant from um, that family and, uh, and gave us those portraits. So uh, the one portrait's on display in the gallery there continue a long history of some of Alton's uh, fantastic portraiture uh, that also documents uh, Grand Rapids history. Uh, and then on the second floor, uh, we have a special exhibition, A Garden of Delights, Artists Embrace the Flower. Uh, which is work drawn from Grand Valley's entire collection, but features artists not only uh, including Matthias Alton, but other well-known artists that uh, you may know, Armin Marazon, um, Claudia Liberatore, Mike McDonald, uh, Michael Flager. Uh, so that's up on the second floor, and that's up uh, through August. Uh, if you get a chance to see it tonight, that'd be great. Otherwise, please come back. Uh, the gallery is always open uh, Fridays and Saturdays, 1 to 5, and also by appointment please reach out to the staff and we'd be happy to arrange a, a special tour or a special time for you if you can't make those times. Um, that exhibition uh, features work uh, with artists embracing the use of the flower in many different ways in their work, including very traditional ways, which you can see a painting there uh, by Matthias Salton of some roses in Portland he painted on a visit there, uh, a gift of Jim and Marie Preston, uh, as well as a more contemporary work uh, that we acquired from our Anishinaabe show uh, just a couple years ago um, by Adam Avery, a beaded top hat. And so with that, I'll, I'll move along and pass it over to Nathan again. Thank you. Thank you, Joel, and thank you, President Mantella. Now the real reason we're all here, right? The sculpture. <laughs> Last year, we announced this project was taking place. Uh, it's almost exactly a year to the date when we made that announcement. As you remember, we talked about its placement across the street in the Mount Vernon Pedestrian Mall, which it is where it is uh, today. It was installed last week. Here's the early rendition of some early preliminary planning and designs of what that could be. And while the sculpture is there, and you're welcome to go over in person after this event, we'll have the artists and staff there we wanted to show it to you this way uh, in a video feature so you can see it uh, being put into place and enjoy the unveiling here together.
So as you can see, there's, there's a lot of work that goes into a sculpture of this scale. And this, this level of planning with facilities, urban design, landscaping, uh, down to the design of the actual sculpture, uh, the age of the sculpture, what, what, what is Alton doing, what time period is this set in. Uh, and so our artists will give you some insights into that in a few minutes here. But there's many people to thank, and you'll be hearing uh, from a few of them tonight. But what was so wonderful about the sculpture is not only is it a beautiful work of art in its own right, but it will last for generations now, telling the story of not only Matthias Alton in Grand Rapids, but art in Grand Rapids. Just as the Colder has done, so has Alton, and there's many other pieces and artists here in Grand Rapids that places Grand Rapids on the map, and Grand Valley is a big part of that. So thank you, uh, Brett, for your work. And uh, next up, I want to invite Jim Kahlo. Jim has been uh, in the fine art business now for over 30 years. Jim was a representative on the project from donor uh, Anita Gillio, the granddaughter of Matthias Alton. And Jim has overseen this project from Anita's side, being that conduit, being that facilitator, making sure everything works uh, from the donor perspective for the past three years. So Jim is going to give you a little bit of scope of the history of this project before we move on. Thank you, Jim. Yep. Welcome, everybody, and good to see you. Uh, as Nathan said, I am the facilitator, and it's more of the human aspect of getting this project done. The history of the process that resulted in the creation of this life-size sculpture of Matthias Alton that we celebrate tonight has to be divided into two chapters. Looking at the first chapter has to inevitably come something of a love letter to Jim Straub. This was Jim's idea as the principal author of the Alton Catalog Raisonné. Jim's decades-long effort to record and celebrate Alton's work was a special gift to Grand Rapids and the larger world of art lovers. The sculpture was another step in his effort to enlarge that legacy. After announcing his effort to start this project, kind of on his own, like he did the Catalog Raisonné, I remember when in a phone call, Jim reported that he discovered, miraculously living in Grand Rapids, an artist who specialized in life-size portrait sculpture, an accomplished artist, and Jim was thrilled. And of course, that artist was Brett Grill. Jim conducted a campaign to enlist feedback, ideas, support from other community members and Alton fans. And most importantly, he was interested in the support of Anita Gillio. As all of you know, Anita was Alton's granddaughter, longtime friend of Jim, and an important financial and community patron of her grandfather. Her support for this project was crucial. The famously independent Miss Gillio eventually signed on to the project with a promise of complete economic support. Jim the set out then to search for a site to install the sculpture. He wanted foot traffic. He wanted to introduce Alton to a new audience. In early 2020, Jim's health problems began to limit his driving. I was able to help with some of that driving, which included additional site scouting and a number of meetings with Anita. Those, Anita, those meetings were in Anita's small living room, and while not, certainly not intended, I was up to date on the sculpture plan and the project. In the spring of that year, Jim's health continued to deteriorate and his ability to pursue the Alton project came to a near stop. His passing July of 2020 brought the sculpture plan to a halt. In the autumn of 2020, Anita asked me to essentially assume Jim's assorted duties. As she told me, you are now part of the inner circle. I hope, yeah, I agreed. And she soon thereafter, and she soon thereafter wanted to restart the sculpture project. An appointment and a tour was soon arranged with Brett, and like Jim, I was immediately impressed, and especially so after a visit to his studio and seeing examples of his work. Our, art, our artist was found once again. Nita had a list of prospective sites on well-known public venues and soon I had a number of polite refusals to host a site until Nathan and GVSU welcomed the idea and the project. 
Anita accepted their support and a prospect of a site. Nathan suggested a location on the section of Mount Vernon that was recently closed to automobiles with its proximity to the Gordon Gallery and its numerous pet pedestrians. A couple of wintry visits later, Brett, Nathan, and I, with Anita's concurrence, agreed upon the Mount Vernon site. A legal structure was put in place and the project was contractually and economically up and running and now in the hands of Brett Grill. Brett's artistic role will be covered in other portions of this program, but one aspect of his efforts deserves special mention. Brett created a number of models with Alton in possible poses, wearing different articles of clothing and with different tools of his trade. These models were run by Anita and none of them won their, her approval. <laughs> Anita had a large blown up photo of her grandfather setting out to paint plain air in Leland, Michigan. She would point to that photo and say, that is my grandfather, that's who I remember. And by implication, that's what I want. <laughs> Brett generously agreed to visit Anita and a cold winter afternoon after meeting for the, her for the first time, he sat down with both of us and carefully and patiently listened to her reminiscence of Alton's. She had her large photo present. Brett respectfully reviewed his proposed models and sought her input. And she returned to their photo announcing once again, that's my grandfather. After some time of patiently making suggestions and asking questions, Brad asked if he could borrow her photo to help rework a model, and that happened. Brett went into his studio to work his considerable magic, and that magic resulted in a model that Anita approved, and in my opinion, actually liked. And tonight, we have a finished superb, superb sculpture on Mount Vernon. I would ask in conclusion for the privilege of just coming out and hoping that both Jim and Anita can see the results of all our efforts. And I would like to say thank you, Anita, for supporting and believing, and thank you, Jim, for having the original dream. Thank you. As Jim noted, it was Jim Straub's idea, his creation, his, his brainchild that made this happen. Uh, so as a special thanks to Jim and the Straub family who are here tonight, I don't know where you are, Gail. You're somewhere in the crowd, in the back. Uh, Grand Valley has separately commissioned with the artist Brett Grill for a 28-inch replica of the sculpture, which we will then gift to you and your family to have as a token of thanks for Jim's creation of this project. So thank you. Our artist tonight is J. Brett Grill. Uh, Brett is known for his figurative bronzes and monuments and portraits. Brett has a bachelor's degree in sculpture from the University of Michigan and an MFA in painting from New York Academy of Art. Brett worked as an associate professor of art and director of graduate studies at the University of Missouri for 10 years, and he now holds a studio here in Grand Rapids. Brett has lectured on his own work uh, throughout the Midwest and has exhibited uh, uh, galleries across the country, including that of Chicago and New York. Uh, Brett will now share with us a little bit about the project, uh, the artistic side of the history, his thought process, his work scope. Uh, please join me in welcoming and thanking Brett. Hi, thanks for, for letting me do this. Um, it's uh, always an honor to uh, be able to place my work in the public and have an institution like this trust me uh, with the process of uh, t telling one of their stories. Um, it's especially an honor to work with Grand Valley, a place that just embraces the art in a way that they do, um, and I know we'll be a custodian of the piece. So thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Jim, uh, and thank you to all of you to um, you know supporting this this process and this project. So I would like to talk a little bit about um, my process in coming in and and being looped into this project. Um, or any project like this, I always start with research. I want to understand the individual that I'm going to depict. Um, and a big part of that is just 
gathering visual information. So Grand Valley made that enormously easy for me um, because they have this incredible archive of Alton photos, um, most of which are, are digitized. Um, so I was really able to understand his face well, the way that he held himself, all of the little nuances of the way that he uh, smiles or half smiles, um, and his uh, incredible hair, of course. Um, also part of this project uh, and the process is just to understand the way that he held his body, uh, his body type, um, the type of clothing that he wore, um, also the way that suits were cut back then in the 1930s, which are, you know, obviously di different than fashion today. Um, so I, I try to just pay attention to all the nuance there and the photographs are, are just a treasure trove for, for that type of thing. Um, uh, so there, there's all sorts of photos, not only that are posed like the ones before, um, but of him painting. Um, so the, these are great. Um, you get a sense of what his studio equipment looks like um, and uh, how, how he sort of behaved when he was in front of a picture. Um, so again, this is just a crucial information as I'm trying to figure out how to tell the story of Alton. Um, another crucial resource is all the self-portraits that he made. This is important that he understood how he wanted himself to look. Um, so even though his face might stretch and twist in different ways as, as he ages or depending on how much time he spent with, with a portrait, you get a sense of the, how he thought of himself as, as he was painting, the more of these that you take in. So here's some more of them. Um, you'll notice that the Clothing that he wears in his self-portraits while he's painting is no different from the clothing that he wears when he's out in the world. Times have changed. Uh, in addition, uh, the research process involves just trying to understand how artists have been depicted in the landscape previously. Um, so obviously this isn't a, a, an Alton painting, uh, but it's a very famous painting of an artist in the landscape and what that, that moment of inspiration might look like. Um, sculptures of artists can take a lot of different forms. They can be sort of exhausted like this one, uh, sitting down just kind of, you know, it's been a long day in front of the painting maybe. Uh, uh, also sort of exhausted. Um, uh, th this one was important to me. Um, it, it's a, a, a sculpture of Monet in, um, in Kansas City um, because of what is unfortunately been done to his paintbrush, uh, which is, has become sad uh, because it is out in the world and things happen to sculptures out in the world. Um, so you'll see with the solution that we came up with that a, a paintbrush was not a great idea because they, they tend not to last very well out in the world. Um, so again, all of these sorts of images were running through my head in the initial stages and this is the, the photo that Jim mentioned that Anita loved so much um, that became sort of central to uh, our, our design of the sculpture. Um, and you can see it's, uh, it's kind of a nice photo. He's out in Leland, Michigan. Um, there's some beach grass out there and he's holding an easel in his hand as well as a kind of a portfolio. Uh, I think it might, might even fold out in, into uh, uh, something that would hold the painting. Um, but in other ways, it's, it's not statuesque. It sort of looks like somebody uh, yelled at him from behind, um, and he's sort of looking back, uh, wondering what they want. Um, he's also holding a cigar in one hand, which is probably not great for, for a statue. Um, so when I was sitting with Anita, uh, one of the things that I wanted to know is why she was attached to the picture. Um, because in a lot of ways, it's no, no, nothing uh, uh, unusual or remarkable. Um, and so I, I asked her that question. And if you squint just to Alton's right, you'll notice there are three tiny figures playing in the water. And of course, Anita's answer to that question, why it was important to her, was, I'm in it. Um, which, which seems like a, a very funny answer. Um, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized that it was 
uh, a manifestation, um, something concrete of why events like this exist and why she had this sort of dedication to preserving his legacy. Because it was not just Alton's story, it was her story. And this was a photo that told that. They were, they were together at the same moment, at the same time. Alton was about to do what he did best, and Anita was there. Um, so it made sense to me that this photo was, you know, why, you know, why she, she needed to make the, the statue and why it needed to look like this. So again, after all that research, I start making tiny, tiny models. These are maybe 12 inches tall. And I try to think about what sort of moment is best to capture the story. So a lot of these, he's sort of looking off into the distance in the moment of inspiration, uh, you know, holding the apparatus of the artist. Maybe he's holding a, an easel, a foldable easel. Maybe he's holding brushes, a portfolio. Um, trying to think about how I can uh, also signify that he's out in the world, that um, he's, he's not working in his studio, um, but he's painting plein air. Here's more. There was many, many of these. I'm just going to show a couple. <laughs> Uh, as Jim mentioned, these, these all fell flat because they weren't exact representations of the photo that she loved so much. <clears throat> uh, at, at one point in time, uh, there, there was the, uh, the suggestion that it needed to have a hat because the photo had a hat as well, uh, despite the fact that uh, Alton's hair was incredible and needed to be a part of the sculpture. Um, we were able to hopefully, or uh, at the end of the day, we were able to um, negotiate the hat away. Um, but th these are more, more examples of that. Um, so again, back, back to the, f the original photo. Um, and here's the beginning stages of the maquette. So a maquette is basically a study in full detail of the final sculpture. So this is a crucial part of my process. It needs to have uh, all the proportions correct. Um, the, the drapery needs to fall as if it's falling over a living, breathing body. Uh, the, re you know, the representation of the face needs, needs to be right on, the likeness. Um, and again, this is, uh, I think Jim mentioned it earlier, maybe 27, 28 inches tall. So here it is in process. Um, it's a demonstration of, uh, a project like this is, is fun because it involves a little model making too. I have to, you know, uh, build a version of an easel out of wood that, that integrates with the rest of the sculpture and stuff like that. Um, there it is as it becomes more refined. Um, and then once that's finished, that was shown to Anita and that she, she approved of. Again, I, I'm interested in him looking out toward the horizon, finding a moment that uh, is inspiring to him. Uh, the wind is sort of blowing his hair and his tie. Uh, in his jacket to signify that he's outdoors, um, uh, ready to make the painting. Um, from there, the way that my process looks is I get this digitally scanned. Oh, here's sort of the, um, the genesis of, the, of, of the, the photo to the tiny model to the maquette. Uh, I get that three-dimensionally scanned. Um, this is somewhat new to my process. Um, but I, uh, I use a company in Holland that scans it at, at a high resolution. And we use that um, to, to get a, uh, a foam version of the statue built at scale, which is seven feet tall. Um, and that is built in my shop and we layer clay on top of that. So it preserves all the proportions of the original maquette um, and makes my, my life very easy. So you can see that he's sort of um, holding on to a piece of foam there, that's the easel that hasn't yet been built. But it allows me to dive right into the details as long as the maquette is, is accurate somewhat. Um, there it is uh, developing, some of the details are refined a bit more. Um, there it is uh, coming to life. Um, that's an unfortunate moment when I need to work on the face. The thing that's nice about the foam is I can just remove a head if, if I need to and, and put it back together. Um, there were, we also had a, a wonderful paint box that Anita had um, that I was able to copy uh, perfectly and you know, document and take measurements of. So all, all that is, is accurate. 
um, to, to Alton's and you know actual uh, uh, tools that he used in, in, in plein air painting. Um, putting the easel together. Again, this is all in clay in my shop. And there's the, the final full scale model, seven feet. Um, from there, that's, that's my uh, mold maker, Ben, um, applying rubber to the clay. So we basically make a mold of it, which is a direct impression of the sculpture made in many pieces. Again, rubber going on top. Uh, and then he, these are um, my crew at the foundry. So I use a foundry in Lawrence, Kansas. Um, and so these are the people that did all the, the metal work for me. I come in sort of on the tail end when all the hard work is, is over with. Um, so melting molten, molten bronze and pouring it in pieces. Here is uh, uh, it, it in process. You can sort of see a seam in the middle of it that has just been welded together. And the artistry in what they do is to disguise all those seams. It was probably cast in somewhere between 12 and 15 pieces and assembled in such a way that you would never know. So it, it really seems seamless out there in the world. Um, there's them doing more work. I come in on the, on the tail end and basically do a quality check, make sure all that the surfaces uh, look exactly like my original clay. Him being welded to his base, sandblasted, and here we are applying the patina to the surface, a chemical coating which changes the color of the sculpture um, and assures that it's uh, gonna exist in its environment and not, not change dramatically throughout its lifespan. More patina work. Some close-ups of the metal. And the last stages of the patina. So there he was at the foundry. Um, you, you saw a, uh, a video a few minutes ago um, of the install, and that's how he looks. Thank you, Brett. As you can see, it's a very involved project. Uh, over a year has spent on this. We're thrilled to have it today. It looks beautiful on site. Uh, again, if you want to see it tonight, we have staff and the artist here to see it in person. Otherwise, come at your convenience. It will be here for many years to come. The second part of this project uh, that President Mantella referenced is the augmented reality component. Uh, so as Brett was working and building this, we had a team of people uh, also doing the digital augmented reality work, setting the scene for, for that component. And a little story about this, this is kind of humorous. Uh, this is a project, you know, I had been talking to Dr. Jonathan Inglesma about for many years before this started, and how do we do augmented reality? What, you know, what kind of support do we need? What kind of developers do we need? What kind of students need to be involved? Um, and, and of course, it's hard to get funding for emerging technology sometimes. Um, and so I just kept thinking about it, talking about it, waiting for the right opportunity. And then I was talking to Jim Callow about this project when Anita was ready to move forward with the sculpture. And he goes, well, she's really interested in a uh, holograph. You know, can, can we put a holograph of this sculpture in the gallery in some way so that our students can engage with it in a different way? Um, and so that is what led us to, to this augmented reality component where uh, we said, well, we can't do a holograph necessarily. That's, you know, that's with lights and things like that. Uh, but how about this augmented reality feature? Um, and again, to, for those of you that, don't, that didn't know Anita, uh, Anita would go to the public library to check her email. She never had internet at her house. She never had a personal computer or a smartphone. Uh, so for her to understand and, and see what we're talking about with augmented reality, right? This is, this is kind of a, a big ask. Um, it's, it's someone in their 90s, someone who's not familiar, has not seen this. So this, this is a moment of trust with the university, uh, trust with, with Jim, when Jim was uh, helping her understand this project as well. Uh, so I, again, this, this moment, I think, speaks to Anita's uh, risk-taking element, where she, she, she's willing to do something new, to mix it up a little bit. Uh, she understood that she wanted the bronze sculpture for the public awareness, the, the, the legacy, what that meant, but also understanding that there's going to be a new generation of people engaging with this story of her grandfather, and that there's different ways that this sculpture can be used moving forward. So that's what this augmented reality is about. It's about layering a digital um, 
narrative over the sculpture. So there are many things you can do with that. You can show digital images, you can show video, you can do audio, uh, you, you can do maps, right? You can show locations and proximity and show digital elements in real time. Or with the sculpture, you, you could animate it and bring it to life, uh, which is what we're doing right now. Uh, again, I'd like to thank our augmented reality team. Many of them are here tonight. Uh, Dr. Jonathan Inglesma is here. Uh, Julie Goldstein is here, and our uh, graduate assistant, Andrea, is here. Um, and Hans is not, but uh, he has also been part of this group for the past year. They have been developing this, doing the, 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 the coding on, on both different languages, different platforms. This is not easy technology to deal with. So Andrea has been diving deep into it for the past year, building the framework, building the workflows, understanding how this works in real time, and building it in a way that's sustainable moving forward. Uh, I'll announce it. Well, since we announced the augmented reality first here, I'll announce this first too. We also just made this open source, meaning that the past 13 years of development on the mobile app, including the augmented reality feature, is now open for any institution to use, to customize for their own need at no cost. This is Grand Valley's gift. Oftentimes, this kind of work is well beyond affordability for arts and cultural institutions. Only the top 1% often can afford to hire the developers to do this. The way that we've done it over the long term, using open source software solutions, we can now share that work back. You, you'll be hearing more about that later, I'm sure. <laughs> but to give you a, a, a preview of what this means, what this could look like, how it will see in real space, here is a most working prototype of animating Alton in real time. Hello, my name is Matthias Alton. I am an artist and I love to paint, especially landscapes and people. I was born in Lusenburg, Germany in 1871 and enjoyed making art throughout my childhood. I even apprenticed with the artist Joseph Klein when I was a teenager, receiving my apprentice certification in 1888. The next year, my family immigrated to the United States when I was only 17 years old. We settled here in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and I have called this city my home ever since. I love the outdoors, and although I regularly paint in my studio, I spend a lot of time painting outside. I am carrying my travel easel and paints it. So I can set up wherever I love paint the right location. Over my career, I've painted more than 3,000 works of art in Michigan, across the United States, and in Europe. You can find the largest public collection of my artwork at Grand Valley State University and the George and Barbara Gordon Gallery is right across the street with many of my works on display soon. So hopefully you get an understanding of what this means moving forward, the way that we can layer narratives and information in real time over the artwork. We can enhance, help supplement, add additional experience and information, including wayfinding. So thank you to our augmented reality team. Thank you for that work. Thank you to Andrea. Andrea, can you stand up? I know you don't like this, but I have to. Andrea has been our graduate assistant for the past year. <laughs> thank you. She is graduating this uh, end of this semester. So thank you, Andrea, for your work on this project. You have been the sole person doing the code base of this project, and it's much appreciated. 
I want to do a special thanks, of course, to Anita Gilio. Anita has given many things to the university over the years, including uh, artwork, of course, the catalog resume, the endowment fund that takes care of the catalog resume, um, the sculpture gift, and the augmented reality startup funds. Um, and she's also now uh, <laughs> giving us the maquette of the sculpture, too, that we'll have outside the gallery to, to make reference to that sculpture. There will be a celebration of life and memorial service for Anita this Sunday, September 9th at Fountain Street Church, for anybody interested in that. Saturday, Saturday sorry, Saturday, uh, September 9th. Uh, Willard Larkin is here, and if you have any questions about that event, please uh, talk to him as he's helping organize it. Anita, of course, started the Catalog Resume Fund uh, George and Barbara have started the Gordon Gallery Endowment Fund. Uh, thank you for your support here. Your membership goes to our Matthias Alton Fund. But we, as you can see, we have many funds and many needs, and there are many exciting things that we do here at Grand Valley with the art. So if you uh, believe it, we do, that art matters, that our stories matter, that our students need to engage with them in their everyday, please continue to support us or find new avenues of support if you're interested. Uh, Laura's here, Andrew's here, myself, anybody from Grand Valley will help you connect to these funds if you're so interested. Well, if you thought tonight was a good party, I invite you all to join us next week. Down in Allendale, we're having a uh, Stephen Duran retrospective exhibit. It's the kickoff event of the art celebration at Grand Valley. It's a public reception. Please join us if you're able to. And with that, thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for your support. Uh, thank you for making this possible for our students to engage in these narratives and engage with art in their everyday. Thank you. <laughs>